Hello, my name is Elena Semyonova. I am a researcher at the Institute of Psychology and Education at Kazan Federal University. At the CIES 2021 conference, I am presenting the research titled Education Policies and Indigenous Languages Shift in the Russian Federation, the case of Karelian and Mari languages. Although Russia is home to more than 1,700 indigenous and minority languages and more than 1 million self-identified indigenous persons, there is little research on indigenous language education and indigenous language maintenance in Russia. The centuries of assimilation of minority and indigenous groups into the Russian culture and language have resulted in a gradual loss of indigenous languages. Since 2016, the federal government has placed even greater emphasis on the promotion of the Russian language, also referred to as nation-forming language, to strengthen the civic Russian nation. Recently, the country's minority and indigenous communities expressed concerns over the present and future status of their languages and native language learning. This study investigated the views of two indigenous peoples in Russia, Karelian and Mari, regarding the development of their languages. The study also explored educational strategies in regard to indigenous language education in Russian schools and answered the following research questions. How, when, why and for what purposes are the indigenous languages used by the Karelian and Mari indigenous groups in the two Russian republics, to which these groups are native? What are Karelian and Mari people's views on the future of their languages, including whether and how their development and transmission should be supported? During the Soviet times, the government placed particular emphasis on the multicultural and multilingual national identity and guaranteed all its peoples, regardless of their population size, equal rights to the preservation and full development of their native languages. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the government has been focusing on nation building through essentially monocultural and monolingual national identity building, ultimately aiming at cultural homogenization. This process has been negatively affecting self-awareness among the indigenous peoples and decreasing the number of indigenous language speakers and domains of indigenous languages use. Then, post-Soviet Russia has gone through waves of educational standardization, which have also affected indigenous language learning and indigenous language education. Interestingly, Although the Russian federal state educational standards declared the expansion of opportunities for ethnocultural education in learning of languages, it does not take into account that vital language development takes place during the first three years of children's development and is established before children turn eight. This way, according to the standards, children are not required to master literacy skills in their native languages. In fact, till the age of seven, minority language education must not be to the detriment of receiving education in the state language, that is Russian. However, the research shows that the earlier first bilingual exposure occurs, the more likely children are to develop bilingual proficiency. International experience also shows that making the goal of functional bilingu bilingualism explicit in the curriculum for indigenous communities lies at the core of language revitalization, and functional bilingualism requires daily language practice. The Russian education system, however, neither aims at functional bilingualism nor allows for such extended teaching of an indigenous language. Interestingly, the 2020 amendments to the Constitution guarantee the preservation of ethnocultural and language diversity in the country. 
It is not clear, however, how this amendment can be fulfilled alongside the 2018 amendments to the law on education in the Russian Federation, which allows only voluntary language learning by prohibiting republics, which are homelands of non-Russian ethnic minorities, from making their languages compulsory for learning. This law amendment was brought about by conflicts over language rights that some republics faced. Massive protests were initiated by people who were unhappy with ineffective teaching of indigenous languages that made them feel that they were being taught nothing. This is an exploratory study, qualitative study, that employed purposive sampling to select information-rich cases and obtain a wide range of views from the two indigenous groups, Mari and Karelian. Interviews were conducted primarily in Russian, although occasional code switching between an indigenous and Russian languages occurred in the case of three Mari and two Karelian participants. Such mixing practices happened when the participants described cultural phenomena, such as musical instruments, holidays, festivals, household items, and religious terms. Interviews started with questions about individuals' upbringing, career paths, and educational experiences, before moving to discuss indigenous language use and awareness of changes in indigenous language education policies. Now I will stop on the two groups of Mari and Karelian peoples. The first book on Mari grammar was published in 1775, when after numerous unsuccessful attempts to convert Mari pagans to Christianity through the Russian language, Russian missionaries decided to preach in Mari. Mari were reluctant to convert and have always advocated for a high status of their mother tongue. Later, the Russian Revolution of 1905 had a major influence on the rise of national consciousness of Mari people and the development of literary Mari. In 1923, three years after the establishment of the Mari Autonomous Region, Mari was declared an official language in the region and was used in government agencies. Mari strengthened its position up to the mid-1930s, when for fear of Finnish invasion, the Soviet government began campaigns of political repression and prosecution of Finno-Ugric peoples of Russia. Mari intelligentsia were exiled, printed publications were destroyed, and identification with Mari ethno-linguistic culture was treated as a manifestation of nationalism, which at the time was equated to espionage and treason. The 1960s and 1970s Soviet resettlement policy restructured ethnical composition of today's Republic of Mari El. Mari people became an ethnic minority in their own republic. It was not until 1992 Mari was officially recognized as a state language of the Mari El Republic, equally alongside with Russian. Today, Mari is used in everyday social interactions, mainly in rural areas, included in the school curriculum as an elective subject, and used in regional mass media and national theatre. There are also several non-governmental organizations that are dedicated to preserving the Mari language, culture and raise Mari people's self-awareness. Today, Youth of the Republic are becoming more outspoken about their concerns related to the damage that the language and ethnic identity laws can entail. The same as Mari, Karelians were influenced by Russian Christian missionaries already in the 13th century and were forced to speak Russian alongside their mother tongue. Throughout history, uh, the influence of neighboring Finns was so profound that Karelian was long considered a dialect of standard Finnish. In the 1920s, an official program called Karelianization was initiated by Bolsheviks who established the Karelian Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic and set to create a new culture based on local languages. This way, in 1933, largely influenced by Finnish linguistic traditions, a Karelian grammar using Latin script was published. In the mid-1930s, the Soviet government studied the Great Purge, which contributed to the destruction of the Karelian language and culture. 
Due to assimilation into the Russian culture, the Karelian population has been steadily declining. And today, public life in Karelia, that is, local government, media and education, is centered around the Russian language, culture and lifestyle. Karelian switched codes from Latin to Cyrillic several times, and today the language has been refused the right to be second state language in the Republic, along with Russian, due to its Latin script. Karelia is the only republic with one official state language, that is Russian. In 2019, only 0.7% of school children in the republic studied the language as a school subject. Indeed, compared to other ethnic groups of Russia, Karelians today are in particularly vulnerable position in terms of preserving their cultural heritage. Domains where the Karelian and Maro languages are used in have decreased substantially compared to the past. While the symbolic functionality of these languages is still important to the majority of the participants, their communicative functionality has become secondary to the socially and technologically improved communicative functionality of Russian, especially for young people. The participants spoke about three decisive factors to explain the phenomenon – Russification, urban-rural dichotomy and globalization. Those are the participants' arguments. I know that many of my classmates are Maori, but now they pretend to be Russians. Or, there are more people who think of themselves as Russians. This identity shift is attributed to the legacy of Soviet times. Five Karelian and three Maori participants spoke of the historical repression that their groups suffered during the Soviet time. Extermination and forced migration of minorities during the period of political repressions and prosecutions by the Soviet government shaped how indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in the country perceived indigeneity and resulted in stigmatization and marginalization of the indigenous peoples. The feelings of shame for their ethnicity and fear for retribution pushed them to seek assimilation into the dominant Russian culture. The second factor is urban-rural dichotomy. At school, our class group was all Mari, and we felt contempt from the Russian groups. I remember they called us Cheremis and also farm girls and boys. It was in the 80s. There was real mistreatment. So when I f later moved to a city and entered university, we tried to speak only Russian because it was embarrassing to speak Mari. Indigenous groups in Russia traditionally resided in rural areas in tight and dense ethnic communities. In pre-revolutionary Russia, such communities were often described as illiterate and uneducated. Later, the Soviet government's forced resettlement policy sought to improve their socio-economic situation. Forced migration and assimilation of ethnic Russians to rural indigenous areas resulted in the mixture of languages and cultures and the development of superior attitudes towards indigenous peoples. Today, although slowly dissolving, the urban-rural dichotomy still characterizes indigenous language realities in Russia. Three older generation participants living in small towns reported using Mari every day when interacting with family members, neighbors and friends. For younger generation participants spoke the language on, only when visiting older family members in villages. Karelia, on the other hand, is hardly spoken by young adults and is mainly used in rural areas by older generations. So the third factor is globalization. It's just there is no need to learn it. Take English, for example, it's needed all around the globe and you understand that you're nothing without English in other countries. And Karelian, where is it? Where will you use it? Even if you start speaking the language to people in Karelia, you'll be misunderstood and laughed at. The comment about globalization, I think, does not need an explanation. While nine Mari participants wanted their children and grandchildren to at least understand Mari and preferably use basic conversational phrases, only three Karelians spoke in favor of their children learning the language because there is no culture without the language, as was explained by one of the Karelian participants. The other Karelian participants would not mind if their children wished to learn the language, but would not actively encourage it. 
Contrary to some of these parents' enthusiasm, school children are not motivated to, to study indigenous languages. In both republics, the reluctance stems from the decreasing practical relevance of the language, as well as perceived lack of any benefits of learning an indigenous language. This results in gradual language attrition. Even though today's school children were described as unwilling to learn indigenous languages, seven Karelians reported having found an interest in their culture and language as adults and voiced the regret of not learning more about their cultural heritage when they were younger. That can be accounted for by an almost lost tradition of intergenerational transmission of indigenous knowledge and the lack of Karelian-related subjects in the, in the school curriculum. Mari participants, having preserved bits of indigenous knowledge, traditions and language, did not express such regrets. On the contrary, seven Mari participants emphasized the importance of understanding and the the significance of their indigenous history and knowledge. Actually, it is an indigenous land here. I understand it could be hard, but I want to say this. Learning these things means paying respect to the place where you live. The participants also reflected on educational measures to preserve their languages. All Maori participants viewed education inclusive of indigenous languages and cultures as key to strengthen their identities and self-awareness. Eight Maori participants emphasized that the Maori language and culture should be taught as a compulsory subject for everyone residing in the Republic, regardless of their ethnic background. Only two participants preferred it for Maori classes to be offered as an elective. They expressed confidence that learning indigenous languages and cultures is necessary because it pays due respect to indigenous peoples and their land. Some parents, however, believe that the indigenous component is redundant in the school curriculum. The history of Karelian language education differs from that of Murray. Only three Karelians saw the need for the Karelian language and culture to become a compulsory subject in Karelian schools. The others stressed that forcing people to learn is counterproductive and that more important steps in preserving the language and culture should include providing real learning opportunities, such as additional and accessible educational institutions, updated learning materials and innovative approaches to language acquisition. A female participant shared her perception and hopes for today's indigenous language classes emphasizing that success can be ensured only when all relevant stakeholders are enthusiastic and responsible. Summing up, I will underline several key findings that help us understand the linguistic situation of Russia's indigenous peoples better. First, the number of young people speaking Karelian and Mari fluently is steadily declining. Second, the main factors that hinder the use and promotion of the languages include historical Russification that has enforced assimilation of indigenous groups into the Russian culture to escape threats and stigma. Also, forced migration of peoples around the country that enforced mixing of cultures and languages, the domination of the Russian language and subsequent stigmatization and degradation of indigenous languages and also the current Russification and globalization that make indigenous languages seem irrelevant compared to the dominance and relevance of Russian and world's dominant languages, and even a threat to mastering dominant languages. Third, despite the provisions for the protection of indigenous languages within the country's legal framework, language learners hardly have real learning opportunities to maintain in and improve their proficiency. While the situation of Mari is comparatively better than that of Karelian, the domination of Russian culture and language continues to endanger these indigenous languages. The two key messages emerge from this study. The first message is the importance of supporting indigenous languages in a country as diverse as Russia.
where it might seem easiest to rely on one language, Russian, especially as these indigenous languages are already at risk and may not be considered relevant anymore by their speakers. As in, as in other contexts with indigenous populations, Russia's indigenous groups view their languages as an essential part of their identity, the half of which is critical for a strengthened sense of self, belonging and self-respect. The second message is about the need to move from rhetoric to action, to close the gap between the policy and practice, with an understanding that indigenous people have varied preferences as regards to language learning in formal settings, one recommendation is for the federal and local governments to offer a variety of real educational opportunities for families to choose from, including a bilingual program, a monolingual Russian language program, or any other arrangements. Such decisions should be informed by evidence and clear explanations to be provided to parents and their children. Having said that, we acknowledge the utopianism in expecting immediate comprehensive support from the federal government for small group languages. After all, the lack of institutional support for these languages is one of the key reasons for their diminishing vitality. At the same time, one feasible measure can be the allocation of funds to support local initiatives involving innovative approaches to indigenous language preservation. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention.